Classic Talk. Good afternoon, Andy. How are you doing? All right, Tom. Not too yep. bad, thanks. Yeah. Good, yeah, good. still here. <laughs> yeah. Things moving on, though, slowly. Yeah, there's a few. I just... There's a, just been noticing there's a few events that are happening, sort of uh, people meeting up, um, uh, interpreting their own version of what the rules are. But to be honest, I'm, I've, I'm not even sure what the rules are anymore. But um, the two metre thing is still there and the one metre is coming in. But it seems that there's a move to try and sort of people to meet up and just do runs, runs out in the cars and stuff. But uh, maybe we might still get a bit of a season. By yeah. the end of the year, we might get uh, by autumn, might get something. I can't see why, if some of these things are happening, outdoor markets and shopping and all that kind of stuff, why outdoor low risk um, controlled events can't start taking place. But I don't know. Certainly, we'll watch the space. Yeah, um, definitely. Any news on your MG, Tom? Works restarted on it now. Um, it started on Monday, so a few bits and bobs in the order pile, like uh, horns and engine mounts and all the rest of it. So hopefully a bit of progress all right that's cool <laughs> they're working on it at yeah, least yeah they're working on it at least so i should hopefully be able to go and visit it soon yeah i mean i've got the dilemma of just trying to change the oil at the moment on the on the car and on the Ultis, and it's um it's been a pain because about two months ago i bought this uh this book which is an original volkswagen uh, maintenance manual in english for, for, the, for the volkswagen Ultis. and um the diagrams for where the filler and drain plugs are, um, these two diagrams here, they're actually the wrong way around. So I've been chasing my tail trying to work out where's what, where, when, because there was a, there was a, um, there was a Canadian version which had um, uh, an extra, di extra diff lock on it and um, the VW version didn't. And I was wondering whether they got that mixed up with this. Anyway, I've been chasing my tail all week and just worked out that just the photographs the wrong way around. So that lot of good that is. <laughs> um, and obviously you'll remember last week's first part of our chat with Alex Riley. And we have yeah. quite, quite a bit more of that to go. So um, shall we bring that in? Yeah, let's hear from Alex. Because yeah, so, I'll tell you what, what, what I realised, Alex knows his stuff. And yeah. you can certainly hear it <laughs> when he's speaking. Um, I, I've owned I've owned four Trabants for my failings, <laughs> and <laughs> so I've got a, I've got a weird fascination with crap. And um, I think the the thing I like I mean you mentioned about the rubber bumper MG. The thing I like about American spec European cars is how much they create like a Frankenstein's monster of a vehicle. Mm. If you ever want to Google uh, a Mini from Canada back in the 70s, they've got an, an awful sort of set of bumpers on the front of the rear, which is halfway up the radiator. There's all sorts of weird things, but that fascinates yeah. me how that culture sort of like um, changes the vehicle completely uh, out of all character that we, we remember it. And uh, yeah. Well, uh, if you're looking for, if you want to look on the internet for one of the worst offenders of US spec European cars, look up the Maserati Camsin. No thought whatsoever must have gone into producing an American spec car when they developed it. Honestly, I mean, one of the one of the most beautiful cars of the 1970s. I mean, it, 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 almost like the ultimate wedge. But the the way that I mean, the whole rear end is different. I mean, you know, you know, it's got like that glass panel on the back. That's gone, and there's this massive monstrosity <laughs> of a rear bumper on it, and the front as well. And it it's horrendous. I imagine. If you're a, a, an American Camsin owner, you want to get the European bumpers on as quickly yeah. as possible because yeah. it's horrific. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I think the rubber bumper MGB actually is a, is a very well integrated rubber bumper. I mean, it had to have them and it kind of, it does follow the shape of the car and doesn't look excessive. I mean, if you like your chrome and everything, then obviously it's an aberration. and you know, it was also stymied in terms of its ride height and everything like that. And the handling was, well, the road holding was totally destroyed and meant it was just oversteer at 20 miles an hour, apparently. But, you know, it was well done. And it was done by Harris Mann, of course, who... <laughs> the TR. MG Rover Hero. Yeah, there's, 
I mean, it's like the DeLorean, isn't it? We all think about the DeLorean being this sleek, wonderful car that, you know, that we see in Back to the Future and whatever, but the ride height on those American DeLoreans is excessively like a tractor. Yeah. And uh, the European spec one, a completely different setup, but um, it, it's just crazy, really, when you think about it. Um, it was almost a good car. And, well, and, and of course, DeLorean were that close to produce it, to buying the tooling from Triumph for the TR7, to, uh, TR8, they, had, they were going to make their own version, a DeLoreanized TR8 convertible. And the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland agreed in principle, but he, but he thought he sh and he had it within his power to agree the funding that was required. And it wasn't a lot of money, but he felt he had to run it past Margaret Thatcher and Margaret Thatcher, you know, coming out of the back of the whole Lotus and DeLorean 70 million pound nonsense, just said, no flipping way. And the whole thing collapsed. So another wonderful what, what if kind of story. Yeah. You mentioned Harris Mann. I mean, the Allegro, the original drawings of the Allegro looked so good and promising. And then obviously it turned out as it was. It looked really nice, didn't it? Oh, yeah, I mean, it looks great. And it, it was, you know, the, the idea was to, to make a sort of a long, sleek looking car because the, you know, the 1100 was kind of like a low, sleek body in a way. And it was supposed to be sort of like bringing up on that. But yeah, they, they had a overhead cam engines with very long stroke and that raised the height up. And then they had this corporate heater that raised it up further. And then, which I didn't know until quite recently, pressed steel Fisher. When they made the presses, they put extra crown into the panels. So that increased the kind of chubby barrel sided look. There's a have a look on the internet somewhere. It could be AR online or some or something else. I can't remember where it was, but it's I've seen it again quite recently. There's a picture of the final glass fiber mock-up of the finished car mm. with a slightly different grill treatment mm. before press steel. Did the, did the panels and it even then it looked a lot better than it looked in the flesh but <laughs> just at the 11th hour you know they'd managed to work with all these restrictions and just about pulled it off and then they flipping stymied it i mean it is it is a it's a wonderful story but it is a tragedy as well yeah they had one job that's all they had <laughs> one job to skate right and they dropped one the ball completely as we do, we keep doing British sort of industry, I suppose, in some ways, but it creates all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. So, uh, yeah. It does, it does, but, you know, it would, be, it would have been nice if we could have sort of made a few better decisions. And mm. I don't know, I'm just reading um, uh, Oliver Winterbottom's book, you know, the designer who worked at, he worked at Jaguar, Lotus and TBR. And, and that's, you know, that's just fascinating. He, I've only, he's only just started at Lotus, but... You know, the, the shenanigans at, at Jaguar when he's designing cars there and William Lyons and, and the people in the kind of prototyping shop doing the dirty on him and, you know, because of the politics. And, and you just think, you know, the, the European companies were laughing I think, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still are, especially if uh, <laughs> things happen as they're going to do next year. Yeah. Anyway, let's move away from that. <laughs> Not going to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying up parts at the moment for this car I've got just to make sure I've got enough spare so, I, so I've got stuff to keep it going. But uh, yeah, so let's leave that. It's what the exchange rate goes in worse, but it's like five yeah, euros to the pound. Oh, it's mad. <laughs> I've, just, I've, just bought, I've just bought a, um, a CV, CV joint bearing for it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's cheap as chips at the moment, but it's just going to be a pain. So I'm just buying stuff as, you know, hopefully keep it going. They did do a civilian uh, version of the Iltis though, didn't they, for, for a brief yeah. period? They did about 350, um, which oh, didn't yeah. sell well. There were, there were like three times the cost of a, whatever was a, you know, the ultimate car you could buy at the time, I'm trying to think. It's 79, 80, 80, 80 1980 was the year they'd made the civilian ones. Um, right. You could buy three gold GTIs for the same price. So. Really? <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Um, just got something wrong there. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, uh, you, as you're probably aware, it won the Paris Dakar Rally, and I think all they changed was the camshaft and the suspension was changed. But 
I had the good fortune actually of speaking to Roland Gumpert uh, by email oh, yeah. over the lockdown, and he said he was bored. He said the only reason why you've got me speaking to you is because I'm bored. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I asked him a few questions. But the amazing thing about all that is, the the guy took that vehicle and he he won the Paris Dakar Rally just just to get the French interested in the vehicle. But he oh, learned he'd never run a, a, a motorsports team before. Um, so it was his own team. It wasn't out. It was his pre-Audi sport. And um, yeah. he um, he learned his craft of running a team before the Audi Quattro came along. And he developed that, of course, with, with others. Um, he learned his craft with that team. And he came first, second, fourth, and ninth, I think it was. So it was amazing yeah. little story. Um, wow. But the thing is about the Ultis is it's it's a fun, interesting vehicle. But I'm getting a little bit fed up of doing maximum speed of about 50 miles per hour is not <laughs> that great. Well, if it if it does share so many parts with like the Audi 80, we would have had the Audi 80 GT that uh, yeah. had significantly more power. So yeah, you know, well, they... Gumpert, yeah, Gumpert himself put a five cylinder in uh, for the Dakar. So one car ran a five cylinder engine, a uh, developmental engine. So, um, but that was carrying the spares. So with the extra weight, he came ninth, but still finished with all the spare parts in the back of it. And he right. wasn't a, a racing driver, but he managed to do that. But, but okay. yeah, um, it's, yeah. So with uh, the Altus, yeah, it's, it's an interesting vehicle. And it's, uh, it's, it's that story that kind of gets me really. It's that kind of, that's kind of, uh, like you said before, it's the, um, uh, forgotten it's, it's it's all badge engineering as well because the whole thing was built in at, at audi and it's designed by audi by audi right. engineers and it was just it's just politics that got the vw badge on it um the same way you can find the cries of avenger in brazil is it argentina that has a vw badge apparently all yeah. that badge engineering stuff has been doing. yeah that's right it's it was also the plymouth, plymouth cricket wasn't it the plymouth cricket yeah same so yes same thing as well we had an Avenger. We had the instruction. We had the owner's manual there, and it said, you know, the Hellman Avenger, the Plymouth Cricket, the whatever other ones there was. So I was like, oh, Plymouth Cricket. That sounds weird. But it didn't say VW fifteen hundred. <laughs> no, it, it would be quite a cool car to have if you think about it. But imagine how many names it's had because it, it also carried a Talbot badge, the Hillman badge, the Chrysler badge, yeah. the VW badge. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite a crazy sort of um, example of what was happening then. So um, I've yeah. got so, I've got some interesting uh, quattro facts if if you're interested. Yes. I'm I'm not going to forgive you actually, Alex, because I remember that episode of the car years where the quattro was pasted by that Renault. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I mean, you, you want, know, just you want, justice is doing the quattro to win. You wanted the quattro to win, didn't you? I'll be honest with you. I was ex I wasn't expecting the Renault to win. <laughs> and nobody was, I always thought this is, you know, I, I even think that they, they said, Vicky, you do the quarter on this one because you're not winning many. So you're bound to win if you did. And I, I don't know if it's that one or another one, but she like looks off camera at the producer like, oh, like mm, you, yeah. Yeah, but you know, we don't, <laughs> we don't know until that moment of opening the envelope, who's won and you know, they keep it all a secret and yeah. they can choose whatever they like. So, I yeah. wasn't expecting to do quite so well, I must admit. Yeah. But as soon as you start thinking about it and you are advocating for one car, then by the end, you believe in it so passionately because you know everything about it. You think, yes, it is the greatest Group B, Group 4 stroke Group B car because it influenced them all. So exactly. apart from the Quattro. Which uh, yeah. I think the sad thing about what we're talking about here, and I think Tom will agree on this as well, is the fact because we were talking about this the other week, is that a lot of these facts and things that we're talking about are going to be lost perhaps in time because as the younger generations come in, yep. this era of cars is going to fall the same way perhaps as some of the pre-war stuff is now. And I'm just wondering how how do we keep people interested in plastic, especially with the threat of EVs and the environment and everything else? Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, especially because, you know, internal combustion engines are under threat anyway. We do need to engage younger people in cars. And I think we, as uh, classic car enthusiasts and owners, we have a responsibility to engage young people, you know, talk to them about our cars. 
you know, take people for a ride. I mean, that those kind of, you know, when children have a, you know, you, you know, it's like your granddad had a particular car or something, or he took you out in it, and or there was a neighbour who had some sort of fascinating car that you never saw. You know, if that neighbour had told you to clear off or whatever, you know, you might have thought, oh, it's an idiot's car. You, you need to try and engage kids. Maybe if you if you've got kids at school you know, tr do a charity motor show or something at the school. These seem to be quite popular. So get, you know, <laughs> get a school engaged, you know, get everybody in the local community that's got any kind of interesting car, park them on a field, you know, when we, when we can do these kind of things, by the way. And then, you know, people will come along and it, and it, it associates <laughs> cars with fun and, and leisure and, and that sort of thing. And yeah. I mean, I did a thing at the, uh, at the Abista Heritage with the, it was for Classic Car Weekly actually, uh, the Heritage Skills Trust, they, they have an apprenticeship there for classic cars and the kids there were like 16, 17, 18 years old and they were, you know, so into doing stuff on old cars, you know, one of them was an apprentice, uh, uh, you know, a, a Rolls Royce specialist, one was an uh, Alvis, one was a, and, and some were at more general sort of who did everything, you know, and they loved it. You know, they loved the fact that they could use tools. They loved that they could make something that they could, that they could fix something and, and take pride. You know, a lot of the world <clears throat> we live in today is a virtual world. And we, you know, kids spend more and more time kind of looking at screens and doing stuff and, and having these interactions. But actually when you, I mean, I don't know about you, but, the best parts of lockdown for me have been when I've, when I've put I I've put these shelves up, you know, and felt like I'd done a really good job of it, you know, and I'm do, fiddling about doing little jobs on the TRC. I mean, I riveted something on. I've never done riveting before. I did. I riveted on the guide at the back of the window glass. And I've had that riveter from Wilkinson's for maybe 18 months and I've not touched it. And I've, I thought, no, I'm going to flip and do it. And I, it, gosh, it, I was on a high for 24 hours after that. I'd just riveted something. And it was, it was spot on. And that, you know, we are, you know, human beings. We are hands-on people. And, you know, if we can get kids interested in fixing things and, and doing that, then they are going to engage with it. And they're going to think, actually, this is great, you know. Completely agree so, with that point. Completely agree with it. Like the first time you're allowed to work on dad's car or granddad's car, the first time you do something correctly or do something really simple, like an oil change, clean a plug, something like that. But the feeling is you're 10 feet tall as a 10 year old when you first do that. And it's that feeling that you need to, to carry forward. Yeah. Because then you want to, you think, Oh, I can do, I can do that. Well, oh, I can maybe do something a bit more exactly. challenging next time. And then it all goes horribly wrong. And yeah. And it goes <laughs> <for> life. Yeah. <laughs> you need to focus. That's my, that's what I do. <laughs> I think I'm going to do like that. It. Halfway through, and I can't get a screw or a bolt off, and I can't get a thing off, and then it, oh, it won't go back on, and I've lost the it's gone underneath and run. Oh, and I'm yeah, and then you WD 40 a screw, and the screwdriver <laughs> goes through your hand, and it's, it's over. <laughs> there is that, yeah. So, yeah. well, that's so I think we've yeah, that's what happened with me. Sorry, you know, the um, we, we met about oh, about six years ago. I had a, a bright yellow Porsche 914. Uh, oh, I was at yeah. Joe in Wigan, and we, we had a quick yeah. chat about it. Um, but but I I remember watching an episode of Wheeler Dealers and Ed China took the engine out and the the engine was completely knackered on the car um, and when I bought it when I got it imported so uh, it gave me the the thought well if I just undo, undo those four bolts I can drop the engine on an old red trolley from Warburton's and roll it out and I got that far and I thought right what next um, and somebody offered me another engine but I took the bits off one stuck it on the other put it back, bought some fuel injection stuff from 99p, picked it up from a guy in Doncaster, put it back together and I'd never done anything like that before. It was so easy to do. Um, a few little bits from Wheeler Dealers that I'd learned about, you know, about how you could support it and all this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it just gave me that thing. But it's the same old, same old story that you end up with more bolts. I still have bolts now in the garage. I don't have the car anymore, but I've got plenty of bolts from that engine, which didn't go back on. <laughs> Did you, did you mention this to the owner, the new owner? Did you say, oh, by the way, here's a little bag full of extra bolts that you might or might not need? No, I didn't need them. 
didn't need them. Uh, it's like <laughs> when I put the interior back in that Z8, there's there's a few bolts, and uh, so they're on the shelf now, but I can't find where they go. What year is that then? Uh, 1956. Okay. Yeah, it was my dad's, now mine. Been off the road since 1984. Fine, well, what I hope are the final yeah. final months of doing it up. Um, if I'd have known six years ago where we would be now, I would never have started it, but I'm glad we're nearly done. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's yeah. best not to know. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> don't get sentimental over cars, kids. That's uh, <laughs> that's like the number one. You're not supposed to be putting them off. You're supposed no. to tell it as the <laughs> That's life. true. Yeah, sorry. It's wonderful. There's yeah. your heart's all. Yeah, we've got to get the kids involved because you know, we're, at some point in the future, we're going to need um, we're going to need a load of people who can still do up our cars, and we're going to need to make sure there's enough petrol to go around after they mm. stop uh, selling new petrol cars. Um, speaking of that, well, um, a lot of people put in electric motors in classics. Does that make your skin crawl, or is it something you think? Is it a route you think maybe we have to go down? I, I, it's a sort of. I don't. I feel slightly uncomfortable with it. I, f- I feel that the approach that I would prefer is you would have, you know, like they talk about a skateboard with the batteries in and all that sort of thing. Why don't you just put a body on top that looks like whatever you want? You know create like a modular set of uh, motors and batteries and wheels and things. And then if you want, I mean, cause there's, there's guys who do like an MGB type thing with electrics, but it's not really an MGB. It's just, I think they get a heritage shell and then everything underneath is completely new because mm. the amount of torque and, and power that's going through it is so immense that, you know, the, the work you'd have to do on an MGB to make it, you know, work. And, you know, you need to upgrade everything. Yeah. So, you know, make it look like an MGB. Make it, you know, give it all the chrome and everything if that's what you like. But to actually take a, an MGB and chop it to pieces and try and make it into something with an electric motor and then sell it for £80,000 or whatever, I don't, I, I don't know. It just seems like, you know, either you want the classic experience or you want an electric experience. That but looks- if you want something that looks nice, then... You know, put a body on that looks like a, a Fiat 500 or yeah. an old Mini, but don't just sort of try and make it work on a Mini floor pan with all the compromise. Because, you know, it's going to make it a, a, a worse electric car. Yeah. Unless you it. just want it for pottering around and it needs a range mm-hmm. of 50 miles and that's all you're bothered about and you don't want it to you know stop all that well <laughs> handled that well i don't know i mean i don't know i've never driven any electric car actually so i don't know but i i'd like the idea of you know if we're going to preserve old cars let's try and preserve them and make them make them reliable and make them usable more regularly if you want but to actually just kind of chop away everything that it was and make it into something else i don't know but you know let me let them make a few different ones and maybe I would change my mind, but at the moment it seems mm, not too keen. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I mean, somebody did, um, haven't they started rebuilding the DeLorean? We talked about DeLoreans before. I think they started to remanufacture DeLoreans. And of course we've got the, the new, the new continuation Aston Martin DB, TB5, with you know the gold finger gadgets that yeah. uh, Aston building, and yet they're upgrading the engine and lots of other components to make it drive better. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some of these things are just kind of you think, oh, I'm not sure, you know. It's well, it uh, trying to do one thing, but not, but not I mean, all, all the way. It's kind of especially if they're not road legal. I mean, I think uh, you know they've done continuation uh, Zagatos, haven't they? Aston DB4 GT Zagatos, yeah. and I think. Uh, they're not road legal and you can't race them at Goodwood and that sort of thing. But then again, I mean, it's very easy as, as not millionaires to say, Oh, that's absolutely What a terrible idea. But then if you, if you, Oh, I might have one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have one of them. That sounds great. Yeah. 3 million quid. Whatever. Yeah. I'll get one. That'd be, Oh, what a laugh on a track day. That would be our right. So, Sometimes it's we we can sneer at the super rich, but boy oh boy, wouldn't it be good to have that dilemma? 
in <laughs> real life. I mean, gosh, I'd love a bit of that. Somebody, Apparently, the, uh, these continuation cars, you need to, you can have them single vehicle approved for another £180,000. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, somebody at Aston whispered in my ear and said, I think they said the Goldfinger ones, he said there'll be 300,000 it would be. Oh, really? Um, one of those, yeah, apparently, because would of all the different to, gadgets. Would you have to put, like, rubber bullets in the machine guns <laughs> to make it rubber? <laughs> yeah. Or, I think it's, yeah, would probably so many to, compromises. The oil, the oil slick, what kind of oil would they have to put in? Would it be vegetable oil? So that it would be, no, it'd still be slippery, though, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, tricky, right. tricky. Be like KY uh, jelly or something. <laughs> <laughs> Water soluble. <laughs> That's what it would be. Not baby oil. Couldn't put baby oil in it. No. Yeah. Good. I'm glad we've uh, we've okay. cooked that one up. Yep. Yes. So, um, but would you, would you buy one, Andy? Uh, Tom, would you buy would you buy a continuation DB5 uh, Goldfinger car? If it came with the guarantee that you wouldn't lose the little man. Then, <laughs> yeah, they got then a giant. Go. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, the, the whole story about the Goldfinger car is dubious anyway, because wasn't it a DB4 that was that was modified anyway? It was a DB4 mm -hmm. Series Five. Yes, yes, it was. That's uh, so the pub quiz there. points to you. Yeah, well, it makes no sense. Doesn't one have two filler caps on the back? Is that how? You, and the the boot's different, I think, the, the back or something. Anyway, but uh, but yeah, I would I would be I would be unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> the Persuaders DBS, it's a DBS six, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. right? <laughs> with the with the, uh, with the V eight alloys, the GKN alloys. So that you know, Persuaders talking about car, it was impressionable age watching a program about cars. The Persuaders. Mm. I mean, my whole life, I've been trying to be uh, Brett Sinclair <laughs> in the Persuaders. I mean, a DBS V8 would be very nice. The suits, the hair, the international travel, everything. That, for me, that just look, if you want to know what's going on inside my head, it's the Persuaders.